this is Dateline Tuesday, April 8, 1997, tonight. He was John Gotti's right-hand man, a killer with no conscience, until he switched sides, spilled the mob's secrets, and helped put Gotti away. But to these women, he'll always be a murderer. His first murder was my brother. Your brother? Yeah, that was his first murder. We always knew from day one that nobody would have killed my father except Sammy. Now the families of the 19 men he killed want to stop Sammy Gravano from making millions telling his story. As long as it doesn't go to Sammy, that is our pure yes. satisfaction. But then, the Don Fratangelo with the controversial memoirs of a murderer. From Studio 3B in Rockefeller Center, here is Jane Pauley. Good evening. 19 men. He either killed or admitted taking part in their murders. But that's not what Sammy the Bull Gravano is remembered for. He's known as the man who helped put John Gotti in prison for life. But in spite of the blood on his own hands, Sammy Gravano's testimony earned him a second chance, a short prison term, and a new identity. Now, Gravano is ready to tell his stories of murder and the mob again in a new book that, according to some reports, could earn him big money. But as Don Fratangelo tells us, the survivors of Gravano's victims say it's time to stop giving the bull second chances. Gravano cut a deal to get out from under the charges by testifying against his fourth trial, and today the jury came back with a guilty verdict on all 13 counts. Break the mob code of silence and take the stand as a witness for the prosecution. He was vulgar. He was animalistic. He was disgusting. That's what she means by animalistic. Somebody that spits indoors, that's animalistic. I don't even want to refer to him as a person. I don't want to refer to him as an animal either because that to me is disgracing them. He decided who lived and who died. He is Salvatore Gravano. Known since his grade school days for picking on others, he earned the nickname Sammy the Bull. For two decades, he was one of the most feared men in organized crime, murdering his way up the ladder to the highest rungs of New York's Gambino crime family. But then the Bull turned rat, becoming a federal witness in one of the biggest mob trials ever. It was Gravano's testimony that put away this country's most powerful crime boss, John Gotti. Gravano got federal protection and only a five-year prison term in exchange for his testimony, which detailed the men Gravano killed and those who helped him do it. In all, Gravano murdered 19 men, including their father. It was the support of the family. And when you take away the foundation, the building crumbles. Her father. He was a loving man. He was a beautiful person. Her father. He was a little league coach. He was very wrapped up in his children. Her brother. Okay, he was 26 years old, two small kids, got up every day, went to work. And her brother. Michael wasn't a kid that was out in the streets. He was always into athletics and all of that. Although most of these women deny the allegation, federal authorities claim their fathers and brothers all had ties to organized crime. But for these women, even raising the issue misses the point. Whether these men were good guys or bad guys is not the issue. The issue is he's turning around and trying to profit from telling his story of being a lunatic. All of these men, they were not altar boys. We are not professing them to be altar boys. But their lives mattered. Jackie Colucci was the first to lose a family member at the hands of Sammy Gravano. In 1970, Sammy the Bull shot and killed her brother, Joey. They took him for a ride, and Sammy sat in the back of the car with five bullets, and my brother starting at the head. And the next morning, Sammy, Tommy, the boys all came over crying, we're going to find out who did this to Joey. A few years after Sammy fired those shots, Roseanne Mass's brother, Michael DeBat, moved back to Brooklyn to help run their ailing father's bar. It was there Michael met Sammy the Bull. And my father told Michael once, stay with this guy, stick with this guy. This guy's going to be big someday. Father didn't know those words were going to come back to bite him. Michael developed a bad habit, drugs. His sister believed Sammy worried Michael might rat him out if arrested on a drug charge. And then Michael got worried that Sammy was worried. 
two weeks before he got killed, he came to my house like 5.30 in the morning, said, well, watch you after my daughter, be a part of her life. And then two weeks later, he was killed, Michael. He couldn't get out. There, there is no way to get out except the way he got out. Laura and Karen Garofalo's father, Edward, locked horns with Gravano in the early 1980s when Edward reportedly told Sammy he would pay a construction bill like every legitimate businessman within 60 days. Well, that was way too long for Sammy. And um, he came down to the office and he said, I think I'm just going to take your car. My dad drove a Rolls Royce and Sammy wanted this car. And my dad said, over my dead body, are you going to take this car? And what did Sammy do to your father, um, ultimately? He was leaving his house walking to his car, and he was gunned down. Eight, nine bullets in the back of his head, back, neck. Cindy DiBernardo, who never even met Sammy Gravano, didn't know what happened to her dad until Gravano testified he ordered the hit. I saw my father every single day of my life. I mean, speaking to him at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and him telling me, I'll be home at 6 o'clock, and then just never seeing him again, ever. I would have given my eyesight, I would have given body parts to have my father walk through that door again. And I'll never have that. And in the testimony, Sammy refers to your dad as a friend. A friend? He considered her his niece. He killed her father. So you tell me, what do his words mean? What do they mean? Friends coming out of his mouth is garbage. You went to Sammy right. after your dad was missing. Because um, a while back, my, my father said, if you ever need anything, go to Uncle Sammy. Gravano was a familiar face around the Melito house. So when her dad was missing, she turned to this old family friend. He said, but you know what? Let me send the word out right now. My word will be like a whisper. And then uh, pretty soon uh, I'll shake buildings if your dad doesn't turn up. But don't worry, princess, everything's going to be okay. But everything was not okay. Three days earlier, as Sammy sat playing cards a few feet away from her dad, Gravano's associate shot Louis Melito once in the back of the head and once under the chin. Dina still remembers worry, the promise Sammy made her. Okay. He says, I'll find you, dad, don't worry. To this day, the bodies of Louis Melito and Robert DiBernardo are still missing. What happened to the fathers and brothers of these women could have remained a secret forever. But then the FBI arrested Gravano and his boss, John Gotti, and charged them with murder. Twice before, Gotti had been acquitted, embarrassing the government. This time, to ensure conviction, prosecutors say they chose the lesser of two evils and cut a deal with confessed mass murderer, Sammy Gravano. Federal authorities have said that it was very painful for them. Uh, my heart bleeds. Yeah. They patted him nicely on the head and said, good boy. Yeah. So you tell me how difficult must that have been for them. All of us were victimized first by Sammy Gravano. Then we were victimized by the legal system. So that's twice. And then it was uh, surfaced in the, in the newspapers that he's writing a book, and that would have been a third time. Reports that Gravano had received a six-figure advance for his memoirs united these living victims of Sammy the Bull. All feel that Gravano has earned enough blood money from the deaths of their loved ones. Did Sammy make money off your father's death? Of course he did. He acquired all my father's businesses. Did Sammy make money off your father's death? Oh, he, the second my father was killed, he grabbed an attache, uh, attache case full of cash that my father was going to pay for my furniture for the house that he had just built me. Gravano didn't acquire anything for the murder of Roseanne Massa's brother. Instead, he consoled the grieving family with a gift. You got $500 from yeah. Sammy? That's the wake. I even have a little book. You know, when you're, you're at a wake and you have the, the booklets, it's right there. Mr. and Mrs. Sam Gravano, $500. What did you do with that $500? Huh. We burned it. See, Sammy had to kill in order to obtain any type of money or any type of business. See, on his own, to think it out and physically do it 
with his hands without a gun in it? He couldn't. He didn't have the brain capacity to earn a penny without killing for it. What's more, Sammy's not even doing the heavy lifting on his own book. Instead, it's being written by Peter Moss, the author of bestsellers like Serpico and the Valachi Papers. Moss refused to do an interview before the publication of the Gravano book, but he is quoted in a New York newspaper as saying, in this book there are no innocent victims. They're all mob-connected killers. That's Peter Moss. He's selling a book, so we can't take our anger out on him. May he sell his book. May the profits not go to Sammy Gravano. Absolutely. Just finding the profits may be a problem. The deal was made in England, not with Sammy Gravano, according to the publisher Harper Collins, but with Peter Moss. So to press their case, the women have hired a bull of their own, attorney Ron Kuby. Harper Collins apparently has learned a great deal about Sammy Gravano and about the way he does business. In fact, they've structured this literary deal like a mafia operation with lots of layers of insulation between the people who are making the money and the people who are paying the money in, in a conscious effort to evade and avoid the Son of Sam Law. The Son of Sam Law, which could be the basis of a lawsuit by the women, allows victims or their families to recover any profits made by the criminal from the crime itself, including writing about it. For Kubi, this is not the first time he's gone up against Gravano. In 1992, Kubi and his former partner, William Kunstler, tried unsuccessfully to have Gotti's conviction overturned, a conviction made possible by the testimony of Sammy Gravano. He murdered for greed, he murdered out of bitterness, he murdered out of anger, and, and I certainly don't believe that he has written this book solely in order to enlighten the American people about his role in La Cosa Nostra. He wrote this book to become a member of the Millionaire Murderers Club, and that's something we're going to stop. If Jeffrey Dahmer wanted to tell his stories of what he did to these, to these innocent people, there'd be outrage, disgust. So what makes this any different? He's a mass murderer, like any other mass murderer, so he should not profit from this. And that is the cause which has brought these women together, a cause so strong they've agreed to overlook some dark rumors. But I, and I know it's a sensitive topic, but some of you know that Sammy didn't pull the trigger on every one of these deaths, right? Right. Is it possible that the fathers of some of you or the brothers of some of you could have pulled the trigger on someone else? We acknowledge that. We had to leave that at the door. And that's where it remained. In a strange way, these women have formed a sisterhood out of their pain. They are strong, united, and defiant. You, you want to call this organized crime? You want to call this a mob? That's it. We are crime victims. We're our own mob. And we are going to fight until this man gets what he deserves. Is Gravano making a lot of money from this book or any money at all? Today, the author, Peter Moss, told Dateline he's not giving Gravano any money. And the publisher, Harper Collins, said only that its agreement is with Moss and that there's nothing unlawful about the deal. Meantime, Gravano must be pretty comfortable these days. He recently left the security of the Witness Protection Program. This is Dateline Tuesday for April 8th. Coming up next, Jim Jones, David Koresh, and now... Marshall Applewhite. How did these men create cults so committed that followers were willing to kill themselves? It's the happiest day of my life. <laughs> Two diaries found in a garbage dump and apparently written by members of Heaven's Gate in the months before they died. They may offer new insight into the cult. One entry casually lists their recipe for death. Quote, one hour before, tea and toast. Then... 10 pills and vodka. More proof, as if we needed it, of the powerful grip Marshall Applewhite had on his followers. But still, no answers to the one most puzzling question of all. How did Applewhite gain that power? Tonight, Dawn Fertangelo on how cult leaders cast their spell. We may never really know the question that is on everyone's mind, why did they do this? For so many of us, it all seems so bizarre. We're on the threshold of the end of this civilization because it's about to be recycled. Strange people, we think, saying and doing even stranger things. The estimate of the dead at the Jonestown camp in Guyana is now 780. 
sometimes with catastrophic consequences like this. And like this. And now, like this. The gruesome task now of removing 39 bodies. Still, these cult leaders who seem so, let's face it, crazy to us, can engender religious devotion among their followers. So we wondered, how do they do it? How do they create a cult so committed, so submissive, so utterly devoted, that followers are willing to die at their command? Because their death isn't death to them. It's the beginning of eternal life. Robert J. Lifton is a professor of psychiatry at the City University of New York. He says essential to the success of any cult leader, like Jim Jones, is his personal charisma and sense of grandiosity. He creates a euphoria among his clan, and that makes members susceptible to his commands. These gurus are very complicated people. They can have some genuine traits of social and religious leadership, along with profoundly paranoid traits, along with antisocial traits, along with self-destructive and suicidal traits, along with murderous traits. People play What's... games, friend. Lifton says cult leaders convince followers that they are immortal and their immortality can be transferred to them. That leads to strange behavior in our eyes. How do you get people to believe that, one, the leader's an alien, and if they're a follower, they're an alien, and that a spaceship is going to come and get them? Well, any extreme group is likely to draw upon the immediate images and mythology of its society and culture. That mythology extends back more than a thousand years. The Book of Revelation foretells the violent end of the world, and the 16th century astrologer Nostradamus predicted the world would end at precisely the beginning of the year 2000. What is it about David Koresh, Jim Jones, Charles Manson? What did they possess? What every one of them has in common is the capacity to convey to followers a sense that they have renewed energy and life power. Lifton has just returned from Japan, where he's been studying the Am Shinrikyo cult. It was two years ago that the group released deadly sarin gas into the Tokyo subway system, killing 12 and injuring 5,000. Lifton says their leader, like other cult leaders, such as Marshall Applewhite of Heaven's Gate, tap into and validate the fears and concerns of their followers. When I talked to people from Om Shinrikyo, the Japanese cult, they said that the Guru Asahara said things that I felt and believed. And as soon as I heard him say that, I knew he was the mentor for me. And I'm sure that's the way people felt about Applewhite. These people may have come to Mr. Applewhite with a sense of despair and loss somewhere deep inside themselves already. Yes, it could have been despair and loss. It might have been less than despair, but some sense of emptiness and confusion. I believe that David Koresh uh, was divinely inspired. I believe that he was a messiah of sorts. And this is exactly what experts like Robert Lifton are talking about. David Thibodeau was a member of David Koresh's Branch Davidian cult. It appears that Koresh and most of his followers were consumed by the flames. When the government raided the compound in Waco, Texas, Thibodeau was one of those who got out alive. He says he slipped out a side window. He was arrested and held briefly. I believed in David's inspiration 100%. I still do to this day. If I'm not agreeing with him, I'm simply not agreeing with the words that God put down in the book. When you listen to David Thibodeau, you're listening to a true believer. Someone who sees David Koresh as an immensely misunderstood prophet who received messages directly from God. We should admit to ourselves that we don't know what the prophets have taught. He took a Bible and he put it up to his forehead. And he said, when I see the scripture, I don't see this cover and all these pages. I see cover to cover panoramically. ATF, you boys are wrong. Thibodeau takes issue with experts like Robert Lifton, who argue that the personal charisma of cult leaders like David Koresh is at the heart of their success. He says it's much more than that. For instance, Thibodeau says he could be utterly confused by a page of scripture. And then here's this guy, this little, this, this hick from, from Waco, Texas, that just opens his mouth and makes it so clear you can't believe you could never see it before. That, of course, is precisely what defines so many cult leaders, from Charles Manson to Jim Jones to David Koresh, and now 
to Marshall Applewhite. Welcome to Beyond Human. That ability to put into words what their followers have always believed. They offer hope and clarity to people who feel society and mainstream religion have failed them, no matter how intelligent they are. How does a cult leader like Marshall Applewhite convince smart people to join him? Intelligence is not necessarily a barrier to embrace of a guru. In other words, the issue is not intelligence. The issue is hunger for what the guru promises. Very happy to, to be here. And if experts on cults can agree on one thing, it is that as we approach the year 2000, that hunger is likely to grow. And scenes like this may grow increasingly familiar. Here comes a body right now. An answer this week to at least one of the mysteries surrounding Heaven's Gate from the former cult member who discovered the mass suicide. Rio D'Angelo tells Newsweek the reason the cult stockpiled weapons near the San Diego mansion was because Marshall Applewhite feared he was being stalked by the FBI. Rio also says he believes the cult members would like all of the attention they're getting right now because before the suicide, no one would listen.